It's good to be back, although it was, um, it was a good trip down to see my parents in Tennessee. It was a different type of trip, and it was hard to leave, um, say goodbye to them. So it was just a, a whirlwind of emotions while we were down there. So thank you guys for your support um, the whole time we were gone, the prayer support and all that, and also just financial support too. That was, that was unexpected. and. Um, uh, amazing blessing with how much gas is and how little gas mileage our vehicle gets. So <laughs> um, that, was, that was good. Uh, but my mom and dad are, are doing okay. They um, have difficult days every day, and we got to see that firsthand. Um, those of you know, uh, um, Kenny Garners was able to connect me with his daughter and grandson who get me an electric wheelchair for my dad, and that allowed him to be more mobile around the house which is, was a fantastic blessing. So that was a blessing from God using people here to bring that down. So this, it's just, just amazing how God is supplying for their needs in this time. And while we feel like we can't do anything from this distance, um, he's reminding me just to trust him because he is still watching over them and he won't let them go um, all the way to the end. He'll see them through. So thank you again. Thank you for the birthday cards as well. That was, that was, it was really nice to come back home and have a stack of birthday cards waiting for me. Um, and also, too, I just want to say, you know, Amanda and I prayed for years to, to get um, just young families and people here and people that are, um, are not afraid of technology. <laughs> and so we have two young men up in the sound booth. Um, right now, and, you know, and they rotate, Zeke also rotates, but Wesley and Nolan last week did a fantastic job with the live stream and with the words, so I watched it remotely, and I just, I wanted to give them the praise publicly as well, because I just, I watched it like, I didn't have to answer, no one actually called me twice, <laughs> just to go over a couple of things, and I thought, wow, you're doing fantastic, so thank you guys, God has definitely placed you here. Um, yeah. But we are in 2 Corinthians this morning again. We are in chapter 6. And we're just looking at the first two verses of chapter 6. This is page 1211 in your pew Bible, if you um, are using a pew Bible this morning. This is what it says. As God's fellows workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now was a time of God's favor. Now is a day of salvation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. We thank you that you have blessed us with another day of life. We thank you for your word. Lord, let it minister to us. Let it challenge us, encourage us, correct us, and grow us, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit as well, that guides us, Lord, gently each and every day and empowers us to carry out the task that you have commanded us to do. And Lord, we pray all these things in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. So some good news for uh, people this morning, like Pam. It should be a shorter sermon than normal. So I just wanted to share that with you up front so that you can rejoice in that. Yeah. <laughs> First, there's only, there's only one point um, in, this, in this, and that's the, the, the title of the sermon, Don't Waste His, His Grace. And um, that because the, these two verses are kind of a trans, transition verses between chapter 5 and chapter 6. And so it, it was kind of hard to do these two verses with the next um, uh, eight verses and have them meld together well. But next week, I'll, I'll do the next eight yeah. So what, what we're saving this week will make up next week. It's okay. And then this week is communion, so it all works out. We'll still be here the same amount of time. Yeah, th yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but during, for those of you here for the cantata, during the, during the welcome um, and introduction segment of the cantata, um, Shirley asked me if, if I could share briefly on, on grace. 
as this was the, the theme of the, of the cantata. Um, this is going to be a little bit longer than that, but it'll be shorter, as I said. In, in that, I, I shared how many of us have a misunderstanding of grace and what it really, what it really means, right? We have a kind of a very shallow view of grace, maybe even a selfish view of grace. We often see it, right, as something maybe earned or a transactional where we bestow grace upon somebody else or they bestow it upon us because of our relationship with them or because of something we might have done or they did for us. Um, but we can never earn God's grace. And if it's something we can never earn, then that's just all the more reason why we should rejoice in it and share it with others in hopes that they too will eventually be reconciled back to God just as we have been. And so these first two verses carry on the instruction from, from chapter 5 concerning our calling and, and task as in ambassadors for Christ. And Paul has just finished a passionate plea here that each person who was a new creation in Christ Jesus participate in this, this ministry of reconciliation that we've been called to. Each one of us is reconciled by Christ is to be involved in reconciling the world to God. That's what we're called for. But not all those that are in church are. Not all of us are doing that, either here or in other places that are meeting throughout the world. We have missed that ministry. According to our text, we have received the grace of God in vain. Now, while I was down in, in Tennessee, my parents um, gave me my birthday gift, and one of it, it, was, it was a book, and it was a book by A.W. Tozer, and, uh, or it wasn't by A.W. Tozer, it was a book compiled from A.W. Tozer quotes. So the quotable Tozer is called, I have another book called The Quotable Lewis. What's great about it is you get all these quotes from all their writings that are amazing quotes, and they're all separated by by, by segment, by topic, and you get to look up quotes real quick with having to, having, not having to peruse through their books and find them. And you could find it real quickly. And I, and I love Tozer because his quotes, are, I think, is about as all as I could eat at one time because he's so deep. But this is what he said ab about, about grace, one of the many quotes he had in there about grace. It says, the grace of God is costly because it costs Christ his blood and it will cost us everything, maybe even our lives. That really sums up what grace is, right? It, it gives us a new perspective, a deeper understanding of what grace is, what God's grace is. When one receives the grace of God, the life should, should vindicate itself by being good stewards. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10 states this, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God. Not by works so that no one can boast. So like, okay, not by works, you, he can't earn it. But listen to this next verse. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Right? So we can't earn the grace by good works, but he has prepared good works for us to do. So God expects those who have received grace to be involved in this ministry of reconciliation. For not only are we saved by grace, the grace of God sanctifies us as we join him in this ministry of reconciliation. The grace of God, it, it penetrates us and changes us as we carry out the stewardship which we have been entrusted with. So let, let's get into these first two verses here. So the following thought is based on the teaching the Apostle Paul gives us in verses 17 and 21 of chapter 5, where we are exhorted to be ministers of the word or messes, or, or messes of reconciliation. Here, Paul uh, emphasizes God's exhortation to us. Because we have received the grace of God, we are to work together in the ministry of reconciliation to win others to Christ 
as verse 1 urges us. He says, as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. So this verse points directly to the preceding chapter. Paul is describing the believers the, that the new creations are discharging of duty. God has blessed us by saving us by his grace so that we might be, listen to this, we might be co-laborers with him. That is amazing. We're not only saved, we're now we're, now we're co-laborers with Christ. One of the highest compliments ever bestowed upon us as believers is calling us co-laborers with the Almighty God. We are so unworthy to even carry that name, but yet he bestows it upon us. He who scattered the stars in space set the world upon its axis, created night and day in all forms of life, has allowed us to join him in his creative work. God is busy making sinners into new creations. Hey, he's walking. Look at him go. There's a new creation right there. I love it. Mind of his own, too. <laughs> Don't you love having kids here? Yeah, I love it. Yes. Yeah. Hey, buddy. He's, re he's ready to preach, too. Yeah, he's ready to go. <laughs> but God, God has called us to be his ambassadors. And that's so sort of great, too, right? We're not just ambassadors to, to share Christ with others, but we're ambassadors to show these little ones what it means to be a believer, to live that out. Hear that. We are Christ ambassadors of reconciliation to earth, to all mankind. That's amazing. Just think about that. If you ever feel like you're useless, you're not. If you're one of God's children, you were called to him. You are his ambassador. You have been bestowed upon an amazing title. As partners with Jesus, we go out and offer God's reconciliation to people. As his ambassadors, we experience his empowering grace flowing in us as he works through us and situations to bring about reconciliation with him. God here is entreating us to have received his grace to work together with him and become his laborers. How could, so how, how could one then receive God's grace in vain? What does that mean when it says that here? Well, while Christian salvation, we believe, is, is forever secure, but some of us then choose to spend our lives on ourselves rather than on the purposes to which God has called us. And all of us share in one general purpose as believers. And those who do not join together with God in this ministry of reconciliation have received the grace of God in vain. Do you hear that? If you don't join together with God as a co-laborer in his ministry of reconciliation, you have received the grace of God in vain. Justification is not grace's end result. The justifying grace of God seeks to bring us into fuller sanctification. One of the commentaries says this, you cannot accept pardon and refuse sanctification. How many of you have met people that want to be saved but don't want any change in their life to happen? Right? It's what the world often wants. How many people like look online? Why do you think health pills, diet pills are so big? Right? They want to look good without putting the exercise in. Why do you think plastic surgery is so big in so many places? I want, to do, I want to be able to treat my body horribly, but still look good and feel good at the end of the day. Look at the billions of dollars that are spent on that every year. And God's saying, when it comes to our sanctification, right, 
You can't accept salvation from God and refuse the Holy Spirit to sanctify you. Can't happen. This grace given to sanctify us is in vain unless we join with God in what he would have us do so that we may become what he would have us be. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 2, 9 tell us what that is, what he wants to be. Verse 22 in chapter 1 of 1 Peter says this, now that, you have been now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply in heart. So first, love one another deeply in heart. And 2, 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Declare his praises. Love people, declare his praises. Share that grace with others. Grace refers to the unmerited favor God demonstrated in the sacrificial death of Christ for us. Christ's death is the reason why people can freely enter into relationship with God. The grace received in salvation must not be received in vain, meaning without content, empty, without results, useless, or a waste. That's what he, Paul is saying here. Don't receive God's grace without knowing the cost of it. When we see that, it's to be taken into stewardship. God has entrusted us with the task of letting others know the good news of his grace. There is nobody off the hook here. If you're a believer, you must let others know about the grace you have received. Like, well, I'm not a good orator. I'm not one to, I'm kind of shy. There's no exception cause. <laughs> Because it's not through your power anyway that you're sharing the grace of God. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. God has entrusted us with this task. Tozer also says this, God does not mean salvation is not a costly thing. Grace does not mean salvation is not a costly thing. It simply means that out of God's goodness, he gives grace to us who are unworthy of it. And knowing that we're unworthy of it and we received it should be all the more reason why we go out and share with others. Right? Think if the ice cream truck was coming down handing out free ice cream. Say, like, hey, tell your neighbors, <laughs> go get some free ice cream. We're not talking about ice cream here, folks. We're talking about God's grace. There is no value we can we can never afford that on our own god has called us to be ambassadors for christ and has given us the ministry of reconciling the world unto him not to do so is to receive the grace which saved us in vain or to no avail for all the lost souls around us as i read earlier in ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 tells us that we were created to be his workmen to do good works Receiving the grace of God in vain means that their practice did not measure up to their profession of being a Christian. That their inconsistent lives constitute a denial of the logical implications of the gospel. Namely, that Christ died for them so that they may no longer live to themselves but his glory. Again, go back. You're receiving salvation. You're like, well, I'm going to still live for myself. Those two, yeah, there's a sanctification process. It's not going to be an immediate change. You're going to grow in that. But there needs to be a change, a walk in that path of sanctification. So think, of, think about this. So, so, so many of us worry about sin in this world, how it's, it seems the world seems to be more and more accepting of sins and wrongs that were not even mentioned years ago, weren't accepted to be mentioned, now are being practiced openly. And while it's good we stand, we stand for righteousness and don't compromise in these areas, fighting these things is not our primary purpose. That's not what God has called us to do. 
If we get angry at the world living in sin and show them our ugly side, use disparaging remarks against them, call them horrible names, and even if we are successful in passing laws that might uphold people from doing things that we disagree with, that is sin, but if we do all that and have not shared God's grace and none of them come to the saving knowledge of who God is, all of that is useless. Completely useless. If anything, Satan would rather us do that than share God's grace. We say, yeah, go ahead. Fight things happening in the school as long as you're not sharing God's grace. Go ahead and fight with your neighbor you disagree with. Just don't share the grace of God. Folks, we are called to share the grace of God with others. When we go to the Bible, it reveals to us, it shows all of us how much we all have fallen short. None of us measure up to God's standards. We know that there is no way for someone to truly change from their sinful ways externally or internally apart from Jesus Christ. We can't ever legislate somebody to salvation. Ever. The Ten Commandments prove that. The Bible clearly shows the only way to righteousness is through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are commanded then to share this good news and to teach others about it. If we are not doing this, we are using all of our time fighting instead of showing grace, then we are ourselves receiving God's grace in vain. You could be trying to live a sin-free life or ridiculing others of how they are living theirs, but if you have failed to share God's grace with others, you have taken in vain. You want to know a secret on how to grow in your walk with your Savior? To actually maybe overcome some sin you're trying to overcome? Share the grace of God with others. How? In good deeds and in word. Share it with others. Let your life point others to Christ. I guarantee that when we stop living for ourselves and fully for Christ, people will begin to see him, whether they like it or not. And your sanctification will grow in ways you have yet experienced. And remember, they might reject him, and most of them probably will, but that's okay. That's not on you. You just need to share. I often hear pastors go on and on about how our society is not how it was and when they grew up and blah, blah, blah. Every time I hear someone going off about that, I just shut off. I'm like, whatever. Your grace is in vain. Because they never get to the good part. And that good part is the gospel of grace. And no matter how much sin is in this world, that never changes. That good news never changes. And it will be the same until Jesus returns. And the command in our life to share God's grace with others will also be the same until our Lord and Savior returns to this earth. And if anything... That news is not only not changing, but is getting better as times get worse. So share 
the gospel. It's like a light in a room of lights. As the rest of the lights go out, the single light shining gets all the brighter. So instead of bemoaning the darkness overtaking the world, shine your light in those dark places. Bring the good news. Someone's drowning. We don't ask them how they got there. Explain to them, you should have taken swim lessons, buddy. <laughs> ha, idiot. Let's go pass a law so, you know, he learns not to do this again. Throw him a lifeline, right? Don't let him drown. For all those who accept his grace, God has supplied a challenging and worthy purpose for living, giving eternal meaning to all our days. Acting in faith on his plan rather than on our less significant personal preferences is putting the grace of God to worthy use. Subduing what we want to do and submitting to what God wants us to do, that's putting his grace to good use. Now quickly, verse 2 quotes Isaiah 49, chapter 49, verse 8. Oh, that was pretty cool, Jay's in, in Isaiah and Paul is pointing back to Isaiah. In his verse, though, he changes the, the tense, but it's still the same quote. He says this, For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, in the day of salvation I helped you. These, these words were originally addressed to the servant of, of Yahweh, promising to sustain him in the time of his ministry and to invest with him, spiritual, him with spiritual power so he might be a light to Israel and to the nations. However, this passage, while it has messianic implications, is also addressed to the Messiah's people who represent him. Since Paul's readers have put their faith in the Messiah to whom Isaiah wrote, a specific application is made. So we don't miss it. He underscores it with repeating the word now here. He says, I tell you, now is a time of God's favor. Now is a day of salvation. The intensified form emphasizes that the time is now. The force of this statement is that God conveys his grace and salvation to everyone in the day and time suited to him, and that duty is placed upon us to appropriate that grace in the time appointed by God. He knows who he's calling, but it's our job to share his grace with everyone anyway. So this quotation from Isaiah would have reminded the Corinthian believers of the time when they repented and received the gift of salvation during Paul's reconciling ministry that came in a demonstration of the spirit and of power. Paul has taken on himself the task of the servant and instructs those that possess the knowledge of the messianic prophecies fulfillment to join with him and others in taking full advantage of his day of offered salvation. Paul is saying to join with Christ in reconciling the world, world to himself so that the grace of God would not be wasted. This acceptable time was created by Christ reconciling death. We must use this time of acceptance so that it can be the day of salvation, a day of deliverance for others as well. Notice that God helps us in the day of salvation. Salvation is always, always initiated by God as an act of his grace. In our sin, we can never reach out to God as the Holy Spirit already working in us. He initiates that. That's grace in, that, in and itself. By God's grace, he had restored Israel from exile. Now he offers by his grace to reconcile people to himself through Christ. Now, Zeke, don't say a word. Call me old man. <laughs> Anyone want a teenager? Okay. How many, how many remember, though, the way we used to save files on computers? 
Yeah, okay, can. All right, yeah. I remember floppy disk. Yeah, I remember having like one boot floppy disk that required the operating system, and the other one have your files. Yeah, so I remember them having them in high school and remind me to write code for DOS for my physics and calculus class so that it could figure out problems. But I also remember a key valuable lesson because I messed up a few times, and that was not saving my project. And computers were real glitchy back then, right? All it would take is a single blip of power, software freeze up or any other issue, and everything you've been working on for hours would be lost. No chance of recovery. I'm really happy they changed that and there's automatic save now. Uh, but there was no predicting when this might happen. So after it happened to me a few times, I learned to save early and save often. Right? I got scared when it would happen. One time I even cried. <laughs> a project's due tomorrow. <laughs> right? And I lost a document. Everything was lost for good. But what was true of computer documents is, is true of people. Now, every person who rejects Christ will realize when death comes, it's too late to hit the save button. According to the Bible, our destiny is sealed for eternity when we die. That's why we are urged to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today. Imagine the horror of realizing it's too late. Lost everything forever with no chance of recovery. Maybe there's someone here or watching online that you think you'll have tomorrow. Tomorrow's not promised to us. Please don't put off receiving Christ as your Savior any longer, or you may end up like the rich man in Jesus' illustration in Luke 16. Right? You had the beggar Lazarus and the rich man, and the rich man goes over and he says to Abraham, Just give me, dip your finger in some water. I can't do that. It's a great chasm. Then warn my brothers. It was too late for him. Trust Christ today. It's never too early to receive Christ, but at any moment it could be too late. The gospel is a word of grace for our ears and heart. The gospel is a means of grace and means of salvation. The offer of the gospel is the offer of salvation and the present opportunity is the proper time to accept these offers. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. We know not what will be tomorrow, nor where will it be. We now enjoy a day of grace, so let us be careful not to neglect it. In closing, God offers salvation to all people. Because the reconciling work of Christ on the cross today is indeed the day of salvation, there is no guarantee that any sinner will have the opportunity to be saved tomorrow. Many people put off that decision of turning to Christ, thinking there will be a better time, but they could easily miss their opportunity altogether. Another passage, Isaiah 55, verse 6, says this, Seek the Lord while he may be found. There is no time like the present to receive God's forgiveness. Don't let anything hold you back from coming to know Christ. Now is a day of salvation. And for my fellow believers, let's not let anything hold us back from telling others about how they can be reconciled with God through Jesus Christ. Don't say you can't do it. God's grace is available to all to complete this life and death ministry. Let us each strive not to live in a way that wastes the grace and waste God's grace. Let's live in a way by seizing every opportunity to show or share Christ's love with others. Seize every opportunity that comes your way. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.
Oh, dear Heavenly Father of all grace, we are so unworthy, Lord. We are unworthy to be even your servants, but you call us co-laborers. Let us not take that title or your grace in vain. May the grace of God take a hold of each one of us so that we can join you, Lord, in this ministry of reconciliation. Let our heart's desires line up with your heart's desires. Let us be other let us be able to see others the way you see them, Lord. That your love flow through us. That when people come in our path, maybe are just mean and nasty people, Lord, I pray that you give us the grace and power to still love them so that they see you shining through us. Let us be able to put aside and subdue our own selfish desires, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for giving us grace every day as you sanctify and grow us. And Lord, we thank you and praise you again. And we pray all these things in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen.